Jesus is Lord. Yes, I get to spend many hours in the Word. What a blessing for me. And uh, I also recognize my need for the Lord. So let's continue in prayer one more time. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, the words really are lacking to speak of how great you are. And we realize that we haven't even really seen you yet. We walk by faith. We walk by the truth of the word. We haven't seen you and your fullness. And we know when that day comes, we will fall to our knees in awe and worship. But right now, we are already in awe and worship before you. We recognize how great you are, how infinitely wonderful you are. And so, I mean, we are coming here to hear from you. We're coming here to honor you. We're coming here to be transformed by you. And we recognize we, we can't leave here doing things. We're going to leave here in need of you. We're going to need you for this week and this month and this life. And that's why we're praying right now. Be with the preacher, weak man that he is. Be with his tongue and his mind and help him to be faithful to your word in all ways and remove what is of him and leave only what is of you, I pray. I pray your word would truly pierce through all our hearts and remain, Lord, and bear fruit in us. We will speak about a difficult subject, but it's still very real to us because you spoke on it. Everything you've said is important, and we do not want to be of those who pick and choose what we like of your word. You want to take it all in because it's your heart. It's your mind. You shared it with us, and we want to we wanna love you that way. We want to know you this way. And so again, we come to you to hear from you. Talk to us, almighty God, and transform us. God who created out of nothing when you spoke. We're asking you to speak again here now. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, um, we have enemy, a very serious enemy who's seeking out to destroy us. And I'm not talking about the devil. See, as Jesus continues the upper room discourse, his focus is going to be on the world as an enemy. And it's hard for us to fully grasp that because we live in such a tolerant, accepting, live and let live culture where you can have your truth and I'll have my truth and don't come tell me how to live my life and we'll be okay. And so it's hard to really see the words of Christ as we're going to read them make sense to us like it is for the rest of our brothers and sisters in the East, in the Far East, in the Middle East, or as it was for those throughout Christian history as well. This doesn't mean that it's not for us. We will ask ourselves though, where does this hate come from, and what does it mean for us? We'll answer these questions, first of all, by actually reading the text and getting into it. And yeah, once again, I would like to ask you if you'll please stand for the reading of God's inerrant and infallible word. I will be reading John 15, verse 18 to 25. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now, they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, 
I wonder for those who've been here since the beginning or have listened to a few of the sermons, do you see the break in the fluidity of, God, of Jesus' discourse? Here's what I mean. From the beginning, he's been trying to reassure the disciples who are fearful and anxious, right? Telling them, believe in me. I'm the way to the Father. And yes, I'm leaving you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I won't even leave you alone. I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to live inside you. I will live inside of you even better. And, and you pray in my name, right, in my identity, the Father will provide for you. Because the Father is sovereign. He will make sure you bear fruit. That's encouraging, Jesus. Thank you. And then he starts talking about hate. That kind of comes out of nowhere, doesn't it? It's a little bit like if Jesus is on a field trip. He's the bus driver, let's say, and the apostles are in the bus with him. He's pointing out all the important things they need to know. And then he hits the brakes. Poor Peter flies over the bench. What's going on? Why talk about this hate? That's another question we're going to have with this text. Why? Why did you feel the need to talk about this hate? Where did this hate come from? And again, what does it mean for us? We'll start with verse 18. If the world hates you. Now, this if is not a conditional clause. I mentioned before, if, then this. Not this time. You see, in the Greek, there's also another kind of if. If, and it's the case. It's a provocative if. Paul uses it a lot. He'll say something like, if you have the spirit, you should live like this. He's not questioning if they're believers. He's saying, because you have the spirit, you should be living like this. And so when he says, if the world hates you, he's saying the world, present tense, hates you. Which is weird because he's not saying they will hate you. They do hate you right now. This is when we can actually put ourselves in the same shoes as the apostle and saying, I don't feel that kind of hate right now. But Jesus says, it's still there. This is why we're going to find out where does it come from and what does it mean for us. He, he adds to this, know that it has hated me before it hated you. He's talking about the source here. Right? As we move along the text, we're going to find out they hate us because they hate him. And it's interesting because when we started John 15, we thought he was the source of our blessings. He's the vine. We are the branches. We bear fruit because of him. Without him, nothing. With him, fruit. With him, his name, we have answered prayers. He is the source of blessings. Right? In him, all spiritual blessings. But now he's saying he's the source also of our suffering because of him, hate. Interesting, right? It, it shows that the rest of this text is going to be a contrast. It's going to be presenting a divide, a contrast between many truths. So we see that when we move on to verse 19. And he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Right? From hate to love. But this love is special. It's from the world, and it's only if you're part of its own. Again, in our all-inclusive culture, they will embrace you, they will accept you as long as you think like them. You have the same kind of tolerant mentality as them. That's why they can even accept other religions. You want to be a Muslim? Fine. Be your Muslim over there. And the Muslim will say, that's our truth, and it's okay if you have your truth. The Christians are the only ones saying, no, there's only one truth. There's only one way to God. We don't say the same thing the world does. We are not like the world. Therefore, we don't have this love, this embrace that we, sh we seek, of course, normally. No, he, he actually adds, but because you are not of the world, therefore the world hates you. Right? The contrast again. Hate, love, hate. He, he's reminding us, as I said last time, there's only two realities. Light, darkness. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. And in between is a big chasm. You can't exist there, which is why it's so sad. Why the church and many Christians try to live somewhere in the chasm, trying to create some kind of middle ground. There is no middle ground. Christ is saying very clearly here, you are either of the world and loved by them, or you are of me and hated by them. Right? That's what he says in the middle of that little phrase, but I chose you out of the world. This idea of choosing, we've already seen it before. Remember that one? He chose them. He appointed them to have abiding fruit. And like I said then, and I say again, it's not about a subject of debate 
which side of the election fence you fall on. This is reassurance. This is the assurance. I did choose you. I did appoint you. You will bear fruit. I did choose you. I did take you out of the world. You are no longer part of that reality. And it's tempting here to try to preach a message on not being a worldly Christian. But that's not the point of the text. Because all this falls under the umbrella of God's sovereign, providential work. I did choose you out of the world. You are of this kingdom of light. Therefore, you are hated. Period. It's the same of fact that they need to know, we need to know. And it's important as we continue on in Jesus' teaching, as he will tell them, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. And of course, they'll remember that it was told to them in chapter 13. We're talking a few minutes, maybe a few hours before. It's still fresh in their minds. And they also know the context in which it was said. See, you all remember that in John 13, it's when he washes their feet. And we can actually read this. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also are to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. What's the context? Serving. As the master was willing to bow down and serve them, and by the way, that includes Judas, right? The betrayer, the son of perdition. Keep that somewhere in the back of your memory. It's going to be useful for later. So the context is about serving, and as the master served, you should serve. And he does add a little bit later in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me, the one who sent me. Because that is going to be continued in our verse where we are at. First, one part of the contrast, if they persecuted me, and here it is a conditional cause, right? It's if, and it's the case, again, uh, they will also persecute you. Now, the word persecution actually is neutral in the Greek. It, it means to chase down with vehemence, with passion. It's used in Romans 14 to talk about chasing down what edifies, what unites. It's a good thing. But of course, in this context, it's a very bad thing. Right? It's to chase down so you can hurt and kill the person. And they will have an eye view of this just a few hours from now when they will literally come to get Jesus, hurt him, and crucify him. So they can remember uh, they did that to him, they'll do that to us too. That's your reality. That's one part of the contrast. Now here's the other. If, and it's the case, they keep my word, they will also keep yours. Now see, it's important here to remember that we are under the sovereign, providential rule of God. This is not sugarcoat the message so people want to accept it. It's not simplify the message so people will want it. This is present the message, the same message of Jesus, the gospel itself. This is why Paul can tell the Corinthians that we are an order of life unto life and of death unto death. It doesn't mean make sure you have the right smell because the smell we have is Jesus, is his blood. And for some, they will smell that and get angry and want to hurt us. For others, they will smell that and want that blood for themselves to be made righteous before God. For some will receive it, some won't. Some will come after us to hear the message, others to stop us from speaking the message. That's the contrast here. That's the truth he's laying down for them. And oops. Jesus continues by saying, but all these things, right? And, and the focus, as we will see, is about the negative things right now. All these things they will do to you on account of me. Uh, sorry, on account of my name. And it's important to recognize it is about him and not the name because Muslims love the name of Jesus. 
Uh, Jehovah Witnesses love the name of Jesus. Mormons love the name of Jesus. Even some cults love the name of Jesus. Their version of Jesus, of course. Here we're talking about the person that we see in Scripture, the one who came to represent the Father. Because of him, the true Jesus, they will uh, be angry. That's why you tell these different religions, these Muslims or Mormons, that's not the right Jesus. This is the Jesus, the Son of God, God made flesh. That's when you get the anger part. And it's because they do not know him who sent me. They don't perceive, they don't realize, they don't have the spiritual eyesight to recognize who God really is. And with their share, there's like two ways to really grasp this. On one side, we have all those who, who do believe in a God, a higher power, many gods, whatever you want to call it. They do believe there's something out there, but their version of it. And so when you point to the fact that, no, God is not all-inclusive. God is holy, holy, holy. And there's only one way to get to him. Well, I don't like your God. Right? They get angry because they don't perceive the one true living God revealed in Scripture. But I would say there's also another way for those who really are angry at God, like the atheists. You see, when you push the atheist, the man who says, I do not believe there's a God, when you push him far enough, and I say this having heard many uh, interviews of atheists, when you push them far enough, they will tell you, I can't believe in a God that be all-powerful and all-good, therefore able to fix the problems and doesn't. Because he doesn't, I don't believe he exists. It's basically that. Because they don't perceive the living God who's revealed himself in Scripture. This is the cause of the hate. And Jesus will really go further than that as he moves along in the text. He's actually going to repeat himself twice, talking about his coming, the cause of the problem, and the consequences of that cause. Yes, three C's like a good Baptist. He says first, if I had not come, and of course he did, and spoken to them, his message, right? And here it's tempting to think that it's about the message of love and how God wants to make, have a relationship with us, which is true. But that's not where Jesus goes, right? They would not have been guilty of sin. What was Jesus' message? Repent and believe. And to repent, you must recognize you are a sinner. Yeah, Jesus' message was to point out sin. And not just the religious leaders, not just those hypocrites, right? No, actually, um, let's, let's look at a few texts where we see Jesus talking to Mr. and Mrs. Everybody. One example is found in John chapter 8. See, after he's talked to the religious leaders, and some actually do believe in the crowd, as we read in verse 30, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus jumped for joy. No, wait, wait. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, so that includes a bunch of people, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Because you see, in the Gospel of John, there's two, two types of belief. Again and again, we see there's a belief unto salvation, and those who believe in a sense, they're open to it. They want to know more about it. That's why he can tell them, you seem to be open, but, but you need to really grasp the truth so you be set free. And of course, the Jews jump for joy. Thank you, Jesus. We need to hear that. No, they answered, we are offspring of Abraham have never been enslaved to anyone, who is it that you say you will become free? And I won't put the rest of the discourse, but as you move along and just keeps pointing at their sin and the fact they're children of Satan, their reaction is not, thank you, Jesus, is how dare you? He pointed at their sins and they got angrier and angrier and angrier, just like Jesus said. Another good example is in John 3. We can't forget that uh, after 3.16, there's more verses. 18 and 19. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Amen. I say hallelujah to that. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people, not just religious leaders, not just pagans, everybody, Love the darkness rather than the light because their works 
were evil. That's kind of mean, Jesus. That's his message. He points out sin. He doesn't shy away from that because they need to know the cause of the problem. But because they don't respond to it, well, there's a consequence. But now they have no excuse for their sins. Let's be honest. If any preacher would say that nowadays, would say he's mean. You don't understand what they're going through. Why are you saying such things? This is the word made flesh. This is the Son of God saying they have no excuse right now for their sins. That's the, that's the fact. So we need to, you need to let the words of Christ guide our understanding of truth. And that's when he's going to say he's refrain and tell us that whoever hates uh, me hates my father also. It's all connected together. It's all of this idea they don't perceive God. They don't believe in a God that points out sin. Therefore, I will not believe this God you're presenting to me. They hate me because they hate the Father. At least the true Father, not the one they made up. And like I said, he's going to repeat this idea of coming, cause, and consequence. But first, a sip of water. If I had not done among them, right, coming, the works that no one else did. Don't miss that little phrase because it's a reminder to us. The ministry of Jesus is not something to repeat. It's not about doing the same miracles as him because they were prophesied, predicted. They point to the fact that he was the suffering servant, Emmanuel, God with us. They proved he was the Messiah. They were specific. But it's interesting when he talks about the works, we again be tempting thinking that the works were to point out how God is kind and merciful and loving. Amen. It's true. But that's not where Jesus goes. They would not be guilty of sin. That's where he goes with his works. His work pointed out their sinfulness. And we can ask our questions. How? How does it point out our sinfulness? I'm glad you asked. I would say there's two ways to see it, a general way and a specific way. The general sense is think about the different works and miracles that Jesus did. The cleansing of the lepers. Leprosy is a type of sin. It shows the idea that sin covers the entirety of our body, just like leprosy did. And the blood of Christ washes us clean like he cleansed the lepers. Or think of the man born blind. Right, how he uses Jesus, he uses this man to then point to the fact that they were spiritually blind because they didn't see their need for a savior. But those who do see their sin are those who see like this man does now. Or, or think about the resurrection of the dead, like Lazarus, the widow of Nain, and so forth. We were dead in trespasses and sin, but God who's rich in mercy through cows gave us life. See, death because of sin, right? Because when sin came into this world, death came with it, but Christ brought life. See how all these works and miracles point to sin. But what about in a specific way, Martin? Well, let me show it to you. I think the best example is actually found in John 6. Remember the multiplication of the loaves. Now, John adds a little something extra that the other synoptic gospels doesn't talk about. He talks about the next day. The next day, the Jews try to find Jesus. And Jesus jumps for joy. As you know, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, right? Signs that prove that I'm the Messiah, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Isn't it sad that even nowadays people are trying to use the name of Jesus to get stuff? Well, he's saying that perishes. Use the name of Jesus to get life instead. So, of course, the reaction of the people in the crowd is to thank Jesus for exhorting him, right? No, they say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? How can we earn our salvation, Jesus? So Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? See, it points out how they're hard-hearted. It points out that they want to earn their way to God. It points out that they want stuff 
instead of salvation. His works was pointed to that. That's a good specific example of it. How his work showed their guiltiness. And it therefore brings us to uh, the consequence. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. Again, it, it connected the refrain. Right? They saw. They have no excuse like we saw before. But instead, they end up hating the father and the son. That's the reality of the sinful heart. And that's why he can end his discussion, at least for us now. But the word that is written in their law, in the Old Testament, if you will, must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. This most probably comes from Psalm 69, which is messianic. And we're going to permit ourselves to read a few of these verses it says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemy wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, and I still must restore it. Can't you imagine almost Jesus at that moment with Pilate and the Jews around him? Crucify him, but I see nothing wrong with him. He hasn't done anything wrong. Crucify him. A poetic way of showing us exactly what our Savior went through. They hated him without reason. Because that's what sin does, right? It infects the heart to such a point that people start lifting up their fists to a God they don't even believe in. They don't even understand why. Because they don't even perceive he exists. That's the damage of sin. So that's where it comes from, right? Sin distorting God to such an extent that they can't even see or perceive him anymore. Why did Jesus talk about this? That's a good question after this. Because the disciples needed it. That's my simple answer. You see, as disciples, them and us, we need the encouragements. We need the comfort. We need these things. Yes, we also need the truth. We also need about, to, to know about the suffering. He is the same source that gives us the blessing and the suffering. Right? We need the Philippians passages that tell us to rejoice always. We need the Roman passages that tell us how nothing can separate us from the love of God. We also need the James passages that tell us to rejoice in our suffering or the Peter passages for a chapter of how much you're going to suffer for the name of Christ with one little part at the end that tell us that, you know, cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. One little verse. Four chapters of you're going to suffer for the name of Christ. We need both. They needed both. We need both. But it still brings us to what does it mean for us? Because as I've said, we're not seeing it here. Let us, let us fool ourselves to think that, no, people are really persecuting us here. No, they're not. Nothing like we could see throughout Africa or Asia or the Middle East. Not even close. And if you ever need help to, to, to know about this, uh, reach out to Voice of the Martyrs, and they will tell you um, that not, it's horrible what they're going through. It still doesn't mean that sin has not infected the hearts of those around us, this world we're living in, and there's still this hate for God. It's just manifested differently. We live in a postmodern, and some would say post postmodern, where every truth is, is, is relative. Where you can think whatever you want. And so I can tell you until I'm blue in the face that you are a sinner, you're going to hell, repent, turn from it. God provided a savior. They don't care. That's their reaction. That's their version of hating God. I don't care. I have my truth. You have yours. Don't bother me. It's not the same kind of overt violence that the apostles would know, but it's the same kind of rejection, though. And let's not fool ourselves also, because there is a growing wave of animosity from the government on down to oppress the truth that we're trying to shine. It's getting bigger and bigger. How do we react to that? It's the last little question I wanted to add to finish up. How do we react to this? We push back. We fight back. No, we, we call it in our memory banks. Remember that little part of Jesus 
washing the feet of Judas. Couldn't have just said, wait a second, you're the betrayer, I'm going to skip you. No, he, he washed his feet anyways. He showed mercy to that man. And he said that the servant is not greater than the master. Right? That's why he could also say that we are to love and pray and bless our enemies and add, be perfect as your father is perfect. Because that's, that's what it's all about, imitating God. See, in the Luke passage, where he's talking about the same sermon, he was going to say, be merciful as God is merciful. We're supposed to imitate the one who makes it to reign on the just and the unjust. Right? The one who on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Not to justify their sins, to show mercy. And as ambassadors like Stephen, to have the same attitude. You know when rage came after him, literally throwing stones to kill him? And in the text it says he came to his knees. Probably he got hit in the head at that point. He's not really focused, but he's able to say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them because he's imitating Christ here. He's responding to the hate through love, mercy, and kindness. That's our response as well. It's a call to do the same thing. Oh, we present the truth. We, we don't shine away from the truth, but we do it humbly, lovingly, and I would dare say on our knees as Christ did for Judas. We present that truth. And some will receive it and some will reject it. I'm reminded of a story that I don't remember all the details, but it still hit me, so I had to share it with you, of a missionary many years ago who, who died because of the criminals in the area came after him and killed him. And his wife that wasn't with him in another country, when she found out, she came looking for these men. And at some point, they found her. Why did you want to see us? You do not know that we're dangerous men? That's when the woman said, I just wanted you to know that I forgive you for killing my husband. And I want to tell you about the love of Jesus. Most of them walked away laughing. They didn't hurt her. They just rejected it another way. Some actually came back later to hear about this good news. That's imitating Christ. That's what we're called to do. But let's be honest to say that we need the help of God to do that. So we will end in prayer. Lord Jesus, you showed us an amazing example, and we know that we are far, far from it. But yet we want to imitate you. Lord, we want to be servants of the great master and humbly wash the feet of our enemies. We want to be like you, Lord. And it's hard when there's resistance, rejection, mockery, and even violence. Help us, oh Lord. As we see the growing wave of rejection coming our way, help us to stay on our knees, praying and loving our enemies. Help us to persevere to speak truth, Lord. Believing, believing, Lord, that some will receive it. Some will keep it and apply it in their lives and be saved, even if many reject, mock, and even hurt us for it. Help us to look to the cross where you showed the ultimate demonstration of dying for your enemies and help us to do that because I don't think I'm the only one saying this morning, I can't do that. I need your grace for that. I need your grace for that. So Lord, be with us, we pray. In your mighty name, amen. He's gonna burn it away, the whole furnace will blaze. Eternal the day, somebody come on.